All right, guys, so today we are here with Michael Tolberg, epic photographer and the author of Dance for a Thunderstorm. Yes. How's it going? It's going very well, thank you. I always like to start with something that you're either excited about or grateful for. What am I excited about or grateful for? I've been, I've been excited for being in the privileged position of being in the middle of this incredible dance explosion that took place in the 90s and 2000s. It was an incredible and unique era in American pop culture. Uh, just as important, in my opinion, as the birth of rock and roll or the jazz age or whatever. Um, but unlike those, the rave scene was mostly an underground thing. Mm -hmm. It did not receive a lot of uh, favorable reporting in the mainstream media. Uh, basically, electronic music was on its own in the yeah. States, you know, and um, it was, as a result, it became a very tight-knit community, a very self-supporting community, pretty much out of necessity, uh, because, you know, in those days, uh, we did not get any major record label support. There were no major, you know, uh, nationwide ad campaigns. The, most of the media uh, coverage of the rave scene was very negatively slanted. Uh, you can find a lot of examples of these on YouTube, you know, if you go digging for them. Yeah. Uh, so, being in the center of this whole thing, particularly being in Los Angeles, which at, the, at that time was pretty much the center of raving culture in North America, uh, it was just a, a wonderful experience to be there, to be not just in the middle, but watching this wonderful scene, this wonderful, in inclusive, embracing scene grow almost exponentially year after year after year you know I mean if you were doing a, if you were a promoter at, in these days doing a party uh, and if you did three to five thousand people like in 1995 or 96 you were doing well yeah and then you know toward, at the end of the decade you had gigs like EDC and Nocturnal Wonderland drawing upwards of 40,000 which was huge at those times it's a fraction of what EDC is now yeah. But uh, it, just being in the middle of it, it was an incredibly privileged position. Um, also because, you know, I managed to establish wonderful relationships with so many of the major artists, you know, of the, of the day. You know, I mean, Paul Oakenfold and I have been friends for nearly 20 years now. Uh, you know, people like Frankie Bones, who's a great, great guy, the godfather of American rave. Obviously, you've been in the scene for a long time, yes. but before it wasn't like the thing to do. So what attracted you to <laughs> Good question. Okay, I gotta uh, backtrack a little bit here to explain, uh, uh, give a little bit of background here. Yeah. Um, before I got involved in the rave scene in early '96, uh, I was uh, shooting in the LA clubs for a couple of years, basically from '93 or so onward. And most of these, well, some of these were very mainstream, you know, clubs. Uh, some of them were not. Some of them were like uh, gothic or industrial clubs, which, uh, you know, was, with the goths, it was like, uh, you know, depressing people, but great fashion sets. You yeah. know? Um, and uh, one of the other scenes I was shooting in was the upscale Beverly Hills club, this club scene. This is during the original 90210 years. So there was a lot lot of uh, people with a lot of money going around in there and as a result the attitude at this these clubs were basically very velvet rope elitist yeah, sometimes, snooty. <laughs> yeah pretty, sometimes very snooty and, yeah. and and that really turned me off eventually you know I was like why am I doing this you know I, well I knew why I was doing this because I had my promoter friends mm -hmm. you know they were friends of mine you know yeah. so, and you know, hanging out with celebs and getting free drinks and everything. that's fine, you know. <laughs> but eventually, it just the fun just went down, you know. So I basically the end of '95, beginning of '96, I had my antennae up. Yeah, I was looking to get out of the Beverly Hills thing, and the rave scene started poking its head above water again. Mm -hmm. And I had I had not been a part of the rave scene, but I had seen reports about it in the clubbing mags, you know, and things like that. And it looked, you know, kind of interesting, yeah. you know. So, you know, I said, you know, why not? Let's see what this is about, you know. And so I started going to raves in the spring of 96. And as soon as I did, I immediately understood what was going on there. Uh, the quality of the music was so much higher yeah. than in the clubs. And the attitude was, like, warm and em embracing. And as I tell a lot of people, uh, it was basically inclusive rather than exclusive, yeah. you know? I mean, there was really only one major criterion, and that was, are you a fan of the music? Mm -hmm. Do you like this stuff? If you did, boom, you were yeah. in, you yeah. know? And um, it's uh, it was a, a wonderful developing underground community 
self-supporting um, and uh, you know I mean in the in the beginning some of the promoters were putting together these almost ramshackle events with little more than you know sweat and extension cords and duct tape you <laughs> yeah. know and stuff like that yeah um, but uh, but the the passion was there you know the, uh, there was obviously something there I knew something was gonna happen I didn't know what yeah. because in a lot of ways this is very alien to me uh, the average age of ravers was like 18 or 19 at the time and I was 27, yeah. you know, and I was raised on the East Coast, ba raised on, you know, classic rock, mm -hmm. or what we today call classic rock. Yeah. And um, so it was very unusual for someone like me to really dive head first, you know, into this whole electronic music thing. But, uh, you know, I, my curiosity had been peaked, and I was like, let's, <laughs> let's, let's go with this. Let's find out what this is about. And uh, as, I, as things went on and I became friends with a lot of the... Uh, emerging uh, rave promoters like Pasquale Rotella, uh, like Reza Garami of Go Ventures, uh, like Brett Ballou of B3 Candy, and other, you know, Southern California rave promotion companies. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I became part of this community, and, and my timing was particularly good because this is, as it turned out, the beginning of 96 was what I call this, uh, the second wave of the rave scene, which is the time period in Dance Floor Thunderstorm, which is about 1996 to 2002, when everything exploded, you know, for yeah. all of us. And, and Southern California, in particular, became the center of North American raving culture uh, for a variety of reasons. The two big ones were, for one thing, uh, we had the biggest DJs in the world coming through LA on a regular basis um, or moving there. Yeah. You know, I mean, we had people like uh, Paul Oakenfold moving there, uh, Dave Ralph, DJ Rapp, Sandra Collins, Christopher Lawrence, DJ Dan. Donald Glut. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, and the other thing was that, uh, unlike a lot of other cities, which had venues that were pretty restricted to venues like, uh, you know, warehouses or certain kind of clubs, Southern California had, you know, so many other options. I mean, we had parties in the mountains. We had parties in the desert. We had parties on the beaches. You know, it's and some weird routes to get to here. To oh, exactly. There. You know, if you had to, yeah, map points, <laughs> rave map points, or sometimes two, where you would drive one one place and they would give you a map and you would drive miles away and they would give you another map and then you would go to the party. This is all to throw off law enforcement, you know, of yeah. course, because a lot of these parties were illegal. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, being part of that, that underground thing was great. I mean, because it's funny, part of pop culture, I mean, to, in some ways, to, to seem legitimate, there almost has to be something illicit about yeah. it. You know, there, there has to be something along the lines of, you know, you're not supposed to be doing this, yeah. you know? <laughs> now, <That's laughs> were you, you know, you were 27 at the time when yeah. you kind of came into, like, this industry. Right. Were you a fan of the music before, or was it attending these these raves It was what well, got you into it? Well, it, there was, as I said, I was raised pretty much on classic rock, and as the 80s came around, some electronic music began being injected into it. I mean, you had, well, it really started in the 70s, I mean, with people like Pink Floyd, you know, uh, and uh, as it got into the 80s, you know, synths became, you know, synth synthesizer technology became better, and so you had all sorts of artists, you know, going like really synth heavy, like Madonna, you know, and people like that. And um, in the late 80s, I kind of, when I was still growing up in Boston, I kind of accidentally discovered house music. Uh, I didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. you know. It, I mean, it, in those days, you know, people in the Northeast outside of New York did not know what house music was. I mean, it was all referred to as techno under this big yeah, techno yeah. umbrella, you know, whereas like today everybody says EDM. It's the sort of same umbrella term. Um, and the, the place I really discovered it was a long gone club called Venus de Milo, uh, which still has the best slogan I've ever heard for any club, which was Venus de Milo, we welcome you with broken arms. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, they were playing house music and I didn't know what it was. But I remembered it. I was like, this is interesting, you know. And then after I moved to L.A., uh, then uh, I began poking my head around in the clubs. Mm -hmm. And it started in the rock clubs and then uh, started moving, transitioning into the more mainstream clubs, which were doing, you know, kind of commercial house knockoffs and stuff. Pretty anemic stuff, yeah. actually. But, you know, but when the rave scene came around, 
back again, like in 96, and I started going in there. I mean, I went all electronic. I mean, I didn't abandon rock and roll or anything like that, but as far as my most of my nightlife stuff goes, it was electronic because, as I said, I realized something is going to happen here. You yeah. know, it, it, was, it was obvious, you know. So was there any, like, specific shoot or specific event that you just absolutely will never forget? Oh, there's lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> lots of them. Um, there was, uh, you know, some of the pictures which we'll go through, you know, later on. I mean, there's a picture there of uh, DJ Donald Glaude at Juju Beats in 1999, uh, where he is surrounded by people, you know, ravers, immediately around his turntables because he wasn't on a stage, you yeah. know. And uh, you know, and it's a kind of thing that you very, very rarely see nowadays, especially at festivals, because of course at festivals yeah. you've got people like 50 feet yeah, in the air. It's not possible. You know? <laughs> no, and, and one of the things, and and that particular kind of thing with the DJ being surrounded by the audience, I mean, that was something that was very, very important to us at the time, because what it meant was that the DJ and the audience were in, were interacting. It was interplay going between the two, because what would happen is the DJ would. You know, put a record on there. Yes, records. <laughs> and, uh, and they would put the thing on the table and play it, and the audience would respond, you know, and go, yeah, whatever. And then the DJ would see this and say, oh, okay, what, what can I find? Okay, they're here like, they to like get that, this going? Right? they don't like this. Right. And so, and, and so as a result, the thing would go back and forth and back and forth. And you really, most DJs who are up in, on that platform in festivals have a very difficult time doing that. You know, it's it's like you know when you're completely isolated from the audience, how do you connect with them? How do you interact? And the, the sad fact is that there's several of them that don't. You know, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but let's face it, most of us have seen the videos on YouTube and other places where there are people in the booth pretending to mix, you know, whatever, and pretending to tweak the knobs and over when they brought their whole set on a thumb drive. You know, and that, and to me, that's depressing, you know. I mean, I understand how some DJs prepare music beforehand and you know, have the whole thing ready to go, but when you have, when you've completely prepared everything beforehand, you know, that's not, it's almost like not a DJ set, it's not interaction, it's presentation, it's more like pop music, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, the interaction was so important to us because, you know, in with regular, entertainment and I'm not just talking about concert entertainment I'm talking about you know like stage you know plays and things like that it's a very one-way avenue of entertainment because you got the audience on one side you got the performers on this side and they perform the material and it basically goes this way to the audience it's basically a one-way trip for the entertainment and the audience is almost like a passive sort yeah. of uh, participant in this they're receiving it but that's it you know uh, I, well except they go ah, you know <laughs> but, but that's pretty much it yeah. but that's it I mean when you have the DJ surrounded by the people again it's that interplay it was so important to us back then here we go take a look at that <laughs> That's seven in the morning when everybody is out there again, and uh, and a bunch of kids are pretty foolishly yeah. scaling the rock walls. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, but it was it was a, an incredible time. Yeah, and we talk a lot about you know technology. Obviously, yes. that's um, opened up the opportunities for people as far as musicians, right? Artists, yes. producers, DJs. But what about photography? How do you feel like technology has? shifted how photography is done well it's it's really a very very different era than it was back then because when i was shooting this stuff this was of course the film era mm -hmm. the analog era and um so there were many differences i mean for one thing uh you had a very since you're shooting on a roll of film you had a very limited number of shots you had to be very economical with what you were doing mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know you had to be very careful and, uh, and visualize more about what you were doing. Whereas today, you know, you could just throw a giant memory card, you know, in a digital camera, and just keep shooting and shooting yeah. and shooting until you eventually you get something, you know. And plus, also technology has changed that it's much easier to, for people to capture something. And if you were to give us like a rough estimate of how many photos you took at an event back then versus oh. how many you take now, <laughs> what what's the difference? It was a fraction of what I would do now. Um, on a, if we we're talking just a little warehouse party, uh, I might bring three or four rolls of film. 
which is about 120 you know, frames. And out of those, I would probably get a top quality shots. I would probably get about uh, 30 to 40. So when pictures sometimes wouldn't uh, come out right, you know, I learned not to beat myself yeah. up over it because it was out of my control. Now digital, on the other hand, you can, you know, you can modify things on the fly, as I said. So, uh, you know, and of course you can take so many more pictures. Yeah. So, whereas um, if I had shot, uh, like say, four rolls of film at a little warehouse party or something like EDC, I would shoot 10 or 15 rolls, which is uh, about, 300 to 400, you know, mm -hmm. shots. Today, if I were, well, at EDC tonight, I'm probably gonna be shooting in excess, you know, of uh, 1,000 to 1,500 at least, yeah. you know. And how many photos do you think, like, you end up thinking are, are good shots it's, you it's, review? It's, it's about 10%. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 10%, because Getty demands the best, the best quality. You can't send substandard, you know, stuff to mass media nowadays. Yeah. They demand the best. And so, you know, when you shoot about 1,000 pictures, about 100 of those, I mean, if you know what you're doing, about a hundred of those, those are going to be, you know, the the winners. Those are the ones that you're going to send out. Yeah, okay. And so tell us a little bit about your book and what inspired it. Okay. Well, my book is Dance Floor Thunderstorm, Land of the Free, Home of the Rave. Uh, I published it myself uh, late last year. Um, I put it together uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'd had the idea of the book project for a long time before I actually started on it, which is about um, 2010 or so. Mm -hmm. I'd kicked around the idea of a book project for a long time, um, but once uh, I, around the end of uh, 2009, beginning of 2010, when I saw that none of my old colleagues, my old photojournalism colleagues, were putting anything out, I was like, you know, I'm going to have to do this mm -hmm. uh, because I felt it, re it was really, really important to represent the rave scene's point of view. That point of view had gotten pretty much passed over by them almost entirely by the mainstream media uh, in the 90s and 2000s. So it was important for me at the time to you know put my stuff out in the various rave magazines of the day like Herb and Mixer and BPM and Insider and Lotus you know and others uh, and so I felt basically the same thing about the book and so I spent about a year shopping the project around to a whole bunch of uh, book publishers and got turned down universally you know across the board uh, half of them just didn't get it. Yeah. The ones that did get it, half of those didn't want to touch it because like rave, ugh, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, and the ones that did get it and were interested, uh, they didn't really know what to do with it. I formed my own um, uh, pu publishing company, 5150 Publishing, and. Um, I uh, got one of my old uh, editors from Herb Magazine uh, to basically helm, you know, the project. I got one of my old graphic designers from Herb to, you know, to put the whole thing together visually. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I went through my enormous archives, like over like a hundred thousand, you know, images from those days. Off and on, it took about four years to put the whole thing together. <clears throat> And uh, if I'd been able to work on it constantly, it probably would have taken about two years. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was an incredibly fulfilling project because, well, first of all, I found all sorts of old material that I'd forgotten about completely. So then, in hindsight, do you feel like that was the better route to take? To well, it was the only the route to take. It was the only <laughs> like route to if take. You have yeah. the the option to choose again. Would oh, you go if, if there were if there were book com publishing companies that were open to the idea, I would certainly consider it. Well, tell us all where we can find your book and what's the best way to connect with you. Okay, well, you can find the book at its website, dancefloorthunderstorm.com. It's also on Amazon. And um, the best way to get hold of me is through the book's website, uh, dancefloorthunderstorm.com. Um, there's also actually on uh, iTunes, I put out a uh, iBook sequel to it called Dance Floor Thunderstorm The Outtakes, which uh, is exactly what it sounds like. You know, it takes the best of the material that didn't quite make the final yeah. cut, you know, because this is part of this whole thing, the, the editing process. So, uh, yeah, so the, uh, but the iBook, uh, the outtakes, is great because since it's uh, an iBook, you know, it's fully interactive. There's going to be future stuff coming out. Um, I'm working on a new book right now. Hopefully, I'll be able to get it out by the end of the year. We'll see. Um, and this is a book about DJ portraits. Um, mostly not behind the turntables, you know, mostly okay. in their studios or at home or just hanging out or whatever. And, and there's some live stuff, you know, in there as well. Um, and uh, I'm in the middle of assembling this now. And like I said, hopefully we'll be able to get it out by the end of the year. We'll see. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on and we look forward to checking out that new book. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Michael. <laughs>